TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch, we are not live. Particularly with like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. If you do go live, if we do go live and you happen to miss it, this is where it will be. This channel over here. Um, we also got the Patreon, man. We just started Fresh Meat. Um, three shows are ending. So three new shows will be coming on top of Fresh Meat. So we almost got a full new slate of shows. A uh, full new rotation. We voting on the new shows right now. Um... And then we got the Discord as well, man. All of the links to this information is down below in the description if you want to, you know, check it out. You don't got to commit to anything, but it's worth checking out. I'm not going to hold you. I ain't going to lie to you. We have a good time over on Patreon. It's a little bit different. It's not the same. <laughs> uh, let's get into this, though, man. London gangster convicted of murder, sentenced to 20 years in prison. Kev, this is from the Taboo Room, man. Shouts out to the Taboo Room, man. I'm telling y'all, man. Yo, low key, Taboo Room be dropping. You know what I'm saying? Be going crazy. Make sure I hit the like button because I want y'all to hit the like button. And I'm already subscribed to the Taboo Room, so it's nothing to me. It How many years in total did you serve? Twenty. Convicted of contract killer. Convicted contract killer Kevin Lang shares his story. After serving over 20 years for a murder he, he for a murder he didn't commit, Kevin has been battling tirelessly to clear his name. Despite being publicly labeled as a hitman and contract killer by the media, Kevin is determined to set the record straight and reveal the truth about his past and troubled and troubled and trouble. Oh, about his past. Why is there a comma and an and right? There? All right. Truth about the past and trouble he's faced with the justice system, and he's and, and his unwavering commitment to clear his name. Okay. B for the murder. I was in the special secure units. It's been shown on Whitemore documentary recently. The severity. Oh, I've I've seen him before. of how I was held, what I had to go through whilst I was held. People have no idea and the restrictions and the implications of the grade I was held at. Triple category eight. The only man in this country at the time, whilst on remand, unconvicted, to be placed on those conditions. Um, unconvicted on remand, triple category A? Okay, I was born in the countryside in Harefield, Middlesex. I had a, a beautiful surroundings to grow up in, but very violent. Uh, parents split up, so. A beautiful area, Harefield, Middlesex. And what was your education like, Kev? I'm a clever kid, uh, but I messed around at school. I got expelled at 14. I went to a special, well, went to another school, and then I went to. Um, education's good, but I, I just love to mess around. I had too much energy. But like, uh, Same as me, man. I got expelled. I got expelled my senior year of high school, but they've been wanting to expel me from freshman year. That school never liked me. Attention deficit order. You know, I'm a lot better now than I am because when you're used to sitting in a cell, walking back and forth, back and forward, eventually you get control of the brain and your hypersensitivity. So, Kev, okay, tell me about how your life took a turn and you went down the life of crime. Well, I didn't go down the life of crime. It took me on that path from uh, my childhood, factors in my childhood um, as you're going up into life. I then met a, a young girl in a new school when I got expelled. I uh, started working security doors, on the doors, but I, um, that took me off into areas that I shouldn't have really gone into. Kidnappings and things like that. I'm not proud of that. Kidnapping people who deserved it, I'm proud of that. I'm not kidnapping, uh, I'm not proud of, excuse me, kidnapping people who, who didn't deserve it. I've done that a couple of occasions. Got the wrong person, but I was not for my own fault through they were put forward. Um, so crime, as an early age, started when I was- Does he got Tourette's? No, I'm, this is a real question I'm asking. Curious. Really proper crime, about 18. 
What was the first thing you ever got arrested for? Smashing up the building site when I was a kid. And then violence when I was 15, uh, of an older boy. I got done for GBH on that. Got down to A, broke his nose, had a punch up with him. And then... How did it get so serious? So tell me as well, Kevin, about the incident that changed your life. The incident that changed my life... <coughs> I'm quite... I, I, look, you can imagine what I looked like when I was 18. Slim-faced, 11 stone 7, boxing. So I was on the security doors. Um, that then ventured out into other areas, um, working with a lot of older men, a lot of capable men. Back in the day when you had doormen, you needed doormen, not because the country's now national policy is to have security staff everywhere. Um, so I was working some real rough houses when I didn't look like old enough to be in the gaff. Uh, with that came, I went away for a kidnapping, two years. I should have got a lot more, but the judge should have took the law into my own hands. Uh, a young girl and a baby was threatened with a knife and uh, I went and the police were called, they couldn't do nothing about it. The people came back again. It's a bit more to the story than that. So I took... Oh, uh, okay. You, okay, you were saving a day, low-key. So, so there was £100,000 worth of equipment that was stolen. The girl in the business, one of the ladies who worked in the business, told the owners, one of the owners was my friend. They went to the police. The police had no, enough evidence to do anything. The gentleman that stole the goods came back and was shaking the doors of the offices and trying to get in to put a knife to a girl and a baby and said, we'll cut you and the baby if you go back to the police again. So I then came onto the fold and thought, I'm not having that. And I took away the gentleman who was involved in that gang, but he wasn't. It was his mate that he was put forward. So I, I did some terrible stuff to him, which I regret. I've since met him in restorative justice. But a massive transformation for me and sitting, seeing someone in front of me and hearing how he felt after what I'd done to him. All I thought when I was beating him up and doing stuff to him is that he'd put a knife to a girl and a baby. So that was all I see. I ain't gonna lie, that's respectable, Kev. That, but it was the wrong person, but I get, I get morally where you was going. And then I see this man years later, I didn't, it wasn't the man. It was a massive transformation for me. Um, I went to prison for that. Jury said they made a wrong decision. They came back. Judge said immediate bail application and an appeal. I said, I went downstairs, said, don't appeal. Don't, have a, don't apply for bail. I'm happy with the sentence. I've done six months remand. I got released on a, a, a hearing whilst I was on remand because the police got caught out lying again. Chief Counsel of Police writing down statements wrong and Witnesses being phoned up at the end of their road, saying meet us at the end of the road. There's a picture of Kevin Lane, can you write a statement out and name him? So I got bail six months after being reminded for that. And then I went back to court 14 months later uh, and I was found guilty. Like I say, the jury came back and said they made a wrong decision. I've never heard of that before. Um, and I told my bailster not to apply for bail and don't apply for appeal. I go to prison, I did it, I didn't give evidence. I'm happy with the sentence. And then I, I got out and I went to live in Spain because I had enough of England. Uh... Wait a minute now. The jury came back and said they made a wrong decision. You told your lawyer, don't even appeal it, let me just do the time. Like, hell no. Appeal it, let me out. Um, that didn't work. Okay, I'll... the mother of my children, uh, she came out with the children. <laughs> I ended up falling out of people on the island. John Palmer brings Matt Bullion, not him per se, but some of his workers. Uh, again, I used to have massive problems because I looked so young and sweet-faced, but I had a pretty girl on my arm. That causes trouble, unfortunately. Yeah, it do. Um, and it caused trouble that an evening when I was on the golf de Sir in a steakhouse, a private golf club, I lived on there. There was a problem, people were talking about drugs. Uh, I complained. Next thing I got three people in front of me. Great big bulldog of a man, being quite aggressive towards me. And he said, you want to calm down? I said, well, fuck all do you, stay out of it. <laughs> <laughs> he had arms the size of my legs. <laughs> big bald head, big old chest, right? He must have thought, who's this cheeky little bleeder? But I weren't frightened of anybody, and I say that respectfully. 
I just thought, don't tread on my toes, I won't stamp on yours. Do not try to threaten me, because I will react. I don't care if there's 10 of you in front of me, I will react to you. So leave me alone. And that stems from my childhood, my brother having a car accident, having to wear a big Mr. Magoo crash helmet when I was in the infants, three or four. He nearly died, helicopter, ambulance and all that. But then with that comes a lot of abuse from children. So I was always fighting as a child for my older brother. And then my mum and dad split up when I was a kid. And then, of course, it escalates. And you go through school fighting for your older brother and your younger sisters. But I was a happy-go-lucky kid, always happy, always Frank Spencer personations, Norman Wisdom. You would remember Norman Wisdom, would you? Oh, Mr. Rigsby. <laughs> and doing stuff like ventriloquist acts. So the happy-go-lucky ch child started going off on another path through a tragedy for my brother having an accident. And then it spirals out of control. And you're on that spiral, aren't you? So then I got released. Came back from, so I got released from that. I went to Tenerife, came back to England. I thought I'm not living out of here, it's like a mini England. Too much trouble. I came away from England to get away from that type of carnage. Um, and unfortunately, they were implicated in a murder. And that murder ended up taking me to prison for, 20. in total now, 22 years nearly. I <laughs> served 20. I was in the special secure units. It's been shown on Whitemore documentary recently, the severity of how I was held. Oh yeah, okay, I think I remember that. What I had to go through whilst I was held. People have no idea at the restrictions and the implications of the grade I was held at. Triple category eight. The only man in this country at the time, whilst on remand, unconvicted, to be placed on those conditions. And Michael Howard, he's, I believe he's dead now, so I, I don't want to speak ill of him, but he introduced uh, restrictions, permanent and closed visits, permanent. You don't get to touch anybody. All massive security implications. Legal bugging of your legal visits. Legal bugging. Passed it. Bug their legal visits. Listen to what they're saying. Naturally, in cells well, and as well as uh, social visits. I went to court, had a hung jury for, for, for murder. Can I just go back a, a step there? So how, how did that all begin, the, this, the, the charge of murder? Oh, I came back from Tenerife. Um, I had a car that was stolen the first night. Quite unnatural because I put a, a, there was an immobiliser on it and I took a piece off the engine. And they still managed to take my car off our drive and get it and off they go. As if, I don't know, they seem to know a bit about cars. Travellers did that, local travellers in the area, and I managed to get the car back. Local travellers. went onto their site and said, look, I know you've had the car. I want the car back. I've got a load of petrol. I'm not having it. All right, you're in caravans. I'll just set. Oh, yeah, he a tough dude. He went to the traveler's campsite, the gypsy traveler's campsite, with the petrol, and they ain't do nothing? This fucking campsite of light. Give me them, fuck that car back. And they were very respectful. He said, I don't want any trouble with you, mister. No fools, don't get me wrong, no fools. But they respected that I went on to there. I said, I know you've got my car. Oh, okay. You've come round in the daytime to look at it. And that evening, it's been nicked. And it's been used in a round raid. The police said it's been used in a round raid by gypsies. Two and two, you've got my car. Now I want it back. No ag. No problem, we get your car back, pay for the damage. And they delivered the car back. A little while after, a week or so after, I can't remember now. Um, but we're through that, I, I was loaned a, a car. I went out in that car for a weekend, took it straight back, an old banger. I well, we had the kids in the car, mother of my children. Uh, so I took that car back. That car was then seen by being driven by another male, who was the, the police officer, knows me, who see that car being driven off. See, see, see. This is my whole thing, man. I'm not renting, I'm not using nobody car unless it's coming from Hertz, Hertz rental, you know what I'm saying? A rental car service, you know what I'm saying? You're not gonna convict me of somebody else's crime, bro. I'm a no, 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 there's record that I had rented this car and I did not have it on that day. After I dropped it back and said it was not Kevin Lane driving that car, give a description of the man with dark hair and that. And the car was subsequently, uh, duplicated, the number plate was duplicated, and a, a rep, another car was used at the scene using that number plate. So that then tied it into me, but the car that was used at the scene was a 323i. The car that I used was a 320. 
And there's factors in relation to this that are all in the book, fitting up and fighting back. Uh, and there's no black order on my book. It's been out for two years now, and all the facts in there are, are genuine, factual. Um, so I was tied, brought into the, the conviction as a result of being tied to that car. And then a corrupt police officer was brought into the case. He subsequently went to prison for four years. Two police informers who were working with the police, who was originally arrested for the murder, bragging about it, showing off a gun. They actually gave the card that was used in the murder to somebody else and asked him to burn it. Uh, he'd give a statement. His statement would have been held for me for 12 years. Otherwise, the original suspects would have been in a dock. And that's because the, they were going around admitting to the murder, saying, calling myself Ronnie and Reggie. I wonder which one was Ronnie. The craze? Right? And then, uh, uh, well, I think they might have both been. So, fair play to them, though. Uh, they... Called themselves. They were showing off the gun in the pub. Uh, they said it was used in the murder or, or at the scene. As well as bragging to be in the murder. So they got arrested, and then they brought in the police hander who's worked with them previously on other cases, and they've moulded a case around me. A story of corruption. That's crazy. They turned around and said I was a prolific contract killer, killing people in this country. There's many unsolved murders, like many. There was three police forces waiting to dock arrest me if I'd have got a not guilty. Now I say this, how the bloody hell you be at my door based on what this fella's turned around and said, why don't you go back and ask him how come he knows so much about the murders? Because until up until this point, I've never been arrested for a murder. Please explain to me. Of course, what he was telling them was so severe that I was committing murders for uh, the Chechen government, the Prime Minister of the Chechen government in this country Damn. and other people in this country. £100,000 a hit. So, of course, they thought, poor, we're cleaning the books up here. Doesn't matter what the evidence showed about them taking it in another direction. And the book shows that. Now I've got, I've had law lords, I've had MPs, I've had all sorts of people right across the board. So how is your conviction still standing? What is going on here? Panorama covered my case, Last Chance for Justice, Mark Daly and Louise Shortier, Tracy Alexandra, Susan Shaw for the Forensic Institution of Science. So the evidence used in my case should never have been used. It's false and it's wrong. Yeah, I got found guilty based on that. So when you're in court, and I guess all this is going against you and inevitably you are found guilty, how, how do you feel? Well, I was in court two of the Old Bailey, which is a high security court, and it's a lot of old wood, dark and dingy, and it's, it's got an ear, ear about it, the, the Old Bailey. And the, the first chapter of my book, I'll keep going back to it, but it says... W promo. Keep going back to it. You're doing the right thing. Don't judge me, you've walked a mile in my shoes. And I'm in the dock, mm. and the jury have come back, and they came out with a guilty. And I thought, God, this is it now. My life's over. The police had asked for 30 years to be imposed on me, sentenced. After 30 years, I thought, are you kidding me? I was 27 at the time. I thought, fucking 30 years. And then the judge never sentenced me. He found me guilty. Well, sorry, the jury found me guilty, and he said, stand up, I was sentenced. Uh, there's only one sentence I can sentence you to, and that is life, take him down. And I never knew the difference between a recommended sentence, which means a judge gives you a sentence in court, and he specifies in court that you will say, serve a minimum of 30 years, all right? Which was happened in, in the, in the, uh, in connected to my case. I'll tell you that about in a minute. So he never gave me an open recommendation. And I got the tariff three years later which is a tariff he's from the Home Secretary and he said I have to serve 18 years. I was over the moon. I, was, I got it going down to lunch and there was a screw I didn't really like, no one liked him. Lane, I went, what is it? What do you, what do you want? He said, I've got something for you, New Year's Eve. Give me this bit of paper, my tariff. He said 18 years, I went, what a result! And he's gone, so I'm totally not right about him. I thought, I've just got 18 years. I was expecting to get 30. I've got 12 years off my sentence. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I was innocent. Imagine being innocent and getting 30. But being innocent and getting 18, you thought, God, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Oh uh, man, that's a messed up even mindset. I'm innocent. I'm thinking I'm gonna get 30, but I'm celebrating because I got 18. But I'm innocent. And it's clear it's corruption. Up. It's clear corruption and wrong things are doing in this case. All I did was welcome. It's tough. 
on my case, day and night, day and night, no TV. I thought, I'm not having this, you're not going to do this to me. And I had my own prison sensor. And I had letters, letters, letters out all the time. So mail coming in was quite a lot. And I brought the criminal justice to the negotiating table. And I, I finally won my case and got out. And they said, you, well, I said I won my case. I haven't went back to the Court of Appeal yet because the criminal justice system was corrupt to the core. It's like the canteen culture. You've got people working in the CCRC, the Criminal Cases Review Commission, that were connected to my case. The Chief Constable for Police at the time of my arrest was one of the 14 CCRC commissioners. They also turned around and said that there's staff within the CCRC, that it's inevitable that they were no staff or someone who's involved in my case. But this does not cause, the, uh, cause us to form the view of biased. Well, it does, doesn't it? I mean, let's have it right. You're not going to be in, and further to that, there was barristers working in there that was, it's a trust called the Kalisha Trust, and the Kalisha Trust was set up by Lord Chief Justice Rafferty. Lord Chief Justice Rafferty was sitting with Kalisha at his deathbed, that was a prosecutor in my case, about four weeks after he, I was found guilty. So he was on his last legs, bent the rules quite a bit in my case and stuff like that. Um, in that, when Lord Chief Justice Rafferty was sitting at his bed, she said, we're going to set up this trust to help trainee barristers. Well, the trainee barristers are working in the Criminal Cases Review Commission. So I had three reviews, and each time it's going in front of the trainee barristers. As well as... Bro, that's, that's... What are we doing here? Like, that's messed up. I don't want no... Barristers, I, I would imagine, but what chance do you stand? I don't want no... So I go up on a pill... No. I don't want no trainees doing nothing with my life. Don't put my life in no train. No, I want professionals that's been doing this. You know what I'm saying? Even though it might, it could have worked in his favor. Like, man, they might see like, they might see things different because they knew her. So they not maybe, they might not be as seasoned as, and stuck in their ways as other people, but like, it's like, no, 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 no. Give me somebody, you know? Two weeks before I go up on a pill, because I got released from the prison system, two weeks before I go up on a pill, Lord Chief Justice Rafferty steps into my pill and Lord Chief Justice Hughes steps down. I go up in front of the appeal, I get just told to go away. And my barrister was, he actually, he, 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 let, he swore in court. And he likes you know, and Duncan Campbell, renowned journalist, and so on and so forth. Many people. I can't believe I'm still sitting here convicted because my conviction goes right to the top within the criminal justice system in many departments: CPS, Hertfordshire Police, Criminal Cases Review Commission, Forensic Institute, etc., etc., etc. But if the case gets back to the Court of Appeal, which it should do. I've got to get a new barrister because my barrister's now become a judge. I've had COVID. I've had to go through COVID when my case, my drafts, my papers are meant to be rewritten. So I'm gonna- So you fresh out, you just getting out. Get a new barrister. Why does it keep- And a new solicitor, because my solicitor, Maslin Merchant, is unobtainable. If you are watching this, Maslin, please return my calls, because you don't. And I don't know if you're real, or, but the, I don't know what's going on, or if you've been spoken to by MI6 or MI5 because it's very bizarre that you've fought, fought for me for all these years and now you're not returning my calls. And I've been told by somebody else that they're getting pressure from other departments. He alive still? How many years in total did you serve? 22. 20 for the murder. Yeah. And Mazdin Merchant was with me since 2004, fighting all the way. <laughs> great, Hatchkiss Hughes and Bill, great solicitor. But I, don't, I believe he's either something happening personally in his life or he's, had the, he's been spoken to because it doesn't make sense. Do you think that changed you in any way? Because I feel like doing 20 years for a crime that you've never committed can change someone? Massively. To come out the other side though with compassion and, and, and sense of fair play still. Uh, it has changed me in that I, I believe there are grey areas in life and not everybody who's in prison are bad just because they're in prison. A lot of people, unfortunately, things happen in their life, but it doesn't make them bad people. And who was actually killed in that murder? Um, there was a villain, a gentleman called Robert McGill, local villain, hard man, and he was executed. Yeah. Did they ever find out? Did they...? They know who done it. You can't go, you've got people going around bragging that they done it. I mean, the, the two fellas in my book who got caught with a car, 
Like I say, they gave it to someone and asked him to burn it and dispose of it. Showing the gun off, admitting to murders. But further to that, in the book, they've engaged in confidential chats with the police where they want to assist the police with this inquiry and they, and they decide to uh, give them a number of facts. Now, if you're... Ch I ain't gonna lie, they sound smart and dumb at the same time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But mo nowadays, the police know, like, most killers, if they get over... If most people, if they're overly involved in the case, then they probably did it. You know what I'm saying? But, like, back in them days, it's like, y'all want to give all this evidence? Like, what the... What, what, what? How y'all know? You know what I'm saying? But charged with joint enterprise, then you are involved in that murder. So whatever that involvement is, whether you like that Raul, Raul Malt fella, there's a, a, an Asian lad, he came into Franklin, got 20 years for taking a bit of food to him. But he weren't a criminal, he just went along for the ride. Stupid yeah, mistake, he got 20 that. years, you're going to university and all sorts. Just an Indian kid, out of, duck out of water. 20 years. So, um, the, the conviction... Do you see this war behind me? Me and my twin brother. No. It's now seen massively. The the conviction is now seen massively as, as a grave miscarriage of justice. But I'm still fighting. It's changed me. It's changed me a lot now, Aaron, in that I've come home, I've won my freedom. I was given natural life and said, you shall remain in prison indefinitely at one point. Because I wouldn't do the offending behaviour courses. He wanted me to speak about the index offence. I said, I'm not doing that. Anyway, I won a court case to address my offending behaviour based on other crimes that I've committed. And it's affected a lot of people in prison now because they can go along the same path and hopefully win their, their release. But, but prison changed me. It changed me now that I'm fighting for my conviction to be overturned. And there's so many stumbling blocks in front of me. Even down to being recalled recently. And they've accepted oh, they recalled me wrongfully. Let me out of prison. There's been some heads that have rolled as well. Have you, like, what's going on? Have you getting any payment for this? Like, I, I, somebody's getting sued. Oh. That's over what happened to me. When you get released by the Secretary of State at the 7, seven o'clock on a Friday night, you've got to be gone. We want you out of here. The Secretary of State's going mad. It's, like, chuck me out. So they've admitted to defeat. They've offered me two and a half grand or something like that, compensation for two four and months. A half? I think it starts at 30 and goes up. Yeah, I've now How got... much? Man, it's, like, chuck me out. So they've admitted to defeat. They've offered me two and a half grand or something like that, compensation for four months. I think it starts at 30 and goes up. Yeah, I've now got to pay a solicitor to act for me privately because you can't get legal aid. Although they've admitted defeat by releasing me and offering me money, because I haven't got the funds to take that further, that case just sits there. Because it won't be a thousand, it'll be fifteen hundred, could it be two and a half grand, and then it's, it keeps going and going and going, barristers' costs and things like that. I've already had that once, twenty-four grand got me nowhere. So life's a little bit difficult in a minute. That must build up a lot of resentment, surely. I guess all these times that well, the position that you've been put in, um, I guess. It seems almost as hurdle after hurdle after hurdle. It's hurdle after hurdle. And if you go through the courts for access to a child and you are a criminal based on paper, not that you are an excellent father who's never missed one visit, drives two and a half, three hours, sometimes more, to see your son for an hour and a half visit, go all through that for the courts to lambast you because of your conviction and treat you differently as a result. So I was seeing my son, as, this is by way of an example, separated from the mother of my children. One, I was with her four months, she fell pregnant. We engaged in a relationship, didn't work, separated. I want to see my son, nah. Stop, starts all the, the control stuff. And I've literally, it's going in my favour now. I've got, um, so because of my conviction, Kafka's had an investigation a year. Didn't see my son. I said, but I've been seeing him. How come you just stop, is there any harm come to him? Is there any, any uh, allegations that I've harmed him or anything like that? No. Well, how can you stop me seeing him for you? It can't be in the interest of my son. Well, they did. Yeah, and it came to nothing. They closed the case. And social services said he's an excellent father. He just needs a handover because him and the mother can't get on. Been to court. One access. Just to get weekends. 
Here I am now. Five months I've been waiting for another emergency hearing because the mother stopped the contact again. Because I get Osman warnings on my life where people are threatening to kill me based on my conviction. I try and overturn it. What's that? What was that? You get Osman? Oh, an Osman warning is a threat against your life. The police have received information that someone's going to try to kill you or, or such. And I've been receiving them since 2006. I had four in prison. Stayed in the same cell on the same landings. No one ever tried to kill me. Why do you think that would... Why, why would someone want to kill you, Kev? Well, the people in the book that I mentioned are trying to get me killed to shut me up. Because really? it quite clearly shows that they were working with the police and fitting me up. Going around bragging about the murder and so on. And then they subsequently get found guilty of another murder, another contract killing, once their handler gets sent to prison for acts that he did in another case. Um, they don't want me to keep publicising the miscarriage of justice. And there's other people, there's police officers come forward to the BBC and said they've seen statements that were written out by the corrupt police officer and he said you had to think carefully how to word them and how to sign it. Stuff like that, you know. And my conviction is so corrupt, it's, it's unbelievable, but... <sighs> well, I was about to ask, um, what was the craziest thing you've seen in jail in the last 20 years? <clears throat> Gotta have a lot of stories, man. Number one governor sitting in my cell dressed in suspenders. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that ain't happened. But <laughs> that made a good snatch video, wouldn't it? Oh, I have had. He reminds me of Jim Carrey a little bit. He needs to start acting. Somebody need to get this man an acting role, low key. Governor's in my cell, sitting on my bed, woman governor and all. I thought, oi, 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 here we go. But I was high risk at the time, so everywhere in my cell was, you know, every time I walked in a cell, it was recorded. Lane's gone in that cell, what's he doing in there? Uh, this craziest thing I've ever seen in prison. People go back to the violence all the time, you know, the sheer the violence was atrocious. People slashed to bits, knives stuck in them, and falling off, fat tips over their heads, ears falling off. I see, uh, I've seen blokes battered to pieces. Battered. Sexual deviance in oh. there, shagging people. Oh, their, man. The old pork dagger or the old black sausage sucked. Wow. Uh, so, bit of, just give a bit of heroin. If you know, you got to do something, can you? Not me. I mean, oh, <laughs> I've never given and I've never taken. That ain't happening. But I've seen a lot of things in there, sad things, where you, I've seen people who are in the, on the landings from mental health hospitals, because they were so full at one time, coming into the landings, real severe difficulties. A mentally unstable should not have been on them landings. And then I've seen people shagging them. Not actually seeing them do it, but know that they are in prison. So there's that side of things that I thought, my God. That's brutal. Oh, is this one. Because uh, believe it or not, a lot of the old school criminals, like Kenny Collins, he's a very good friend of mine. And they have a real old school set of principles where you definitely got to have respect for your fellow interns. If you lose that respect for them, then you've got nothing left principle-wise. You've committed crimes, but there's a certain set of rules and guidelines that they used to hold on to. That's all now gone. They're sticking spoons up people's backside to get their drugs out of their bums and things like that in prison now. Burning their feet and tipping oil over their feet with hot water to get money sent to their an account. It's atrocious what's going on in there now. So, hmm, I've seen a lot of changes in there and prisons ain't the same as what they once were and the clientele aren't the same. And with that comes a lot of problems. So anybody that's thinking about going to prison now, you are going into a mugs game. You're losing your life, this isn't a dress rehearsal. One chance at this. If you want to get in there, be abused, will be welcomed into the fold one minute and then robbed and stabbed the next because you don't fit in with the crowd or something's gone on or you don't get on with that. Moral of the story is stay out of prison. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Stay, stay a free man, a free man. Gang over there or someone else come in or you stabbed your brother's mate and you don't, whatever. Loads of implications. If you think you're going into prison now, to have a great time. Oh, no, I don't think nobody thinks that, right? You're a fucking mug. Clearly a mug. Because there's no way of life. I don't mean that to insult people. No, I, I mean it to insult people. <laughs> Individually, 
but collectively, it's a mugs game. Why do gangsters get seen as heroes when they're not? Angels with dirty faces. He was asked to cry at the gallows, and he told the vicar to clear off, but he'd started crying at the gallows so the young kids could see you as weak. But he wouldn't, he wouldn't have done that otherwise. I like that film. Watched it with black and white when I was a kid. The, the heroism should be looked at the soldiers and the, and the special services of this country, True. the nurses, the fire brigade. True. And right across the board in the criminal justice system who are doing very difficult jobs and overstretched services for the better of this country and other countries. And they're the real heroes, but criminals are not. So, well, Kevin, when I was researching your story, I often saw the, the words contractor killer, hitman associated with your name. Do you think that was a fair label to have next to your name? I'll always say it's not fair, but the, the, the arrest and the charge sheet said uh, contract killing. That has an implication that you've not just murdered someone through anger, you're, you're killing, they say, you're killing someone in cold blood for money, which makes right. you a psychopath. But you go to, well, if you're in the army, they're killing people, trained to kill. Are they psychopaths? So I don't quite agree with the terminology, not that I'm saying I did the murder, but to be labelled a psychopath or a contract killer, and it still continues now. So trial by media was great for the media, number one contract killer in the country, in the Times and all these other papers. And now the positive of that, as crazy as that seems, is I'm free and I'll say, well, meet me, talk to me, see what I do in my life today, see what people have said about me as a person and the people have come forward in relation to my unsafe conviction, and judge me. Kev, what would you say is the worst memory of your life, apart, apart, aside from the conviction? The conviction? My mother and father separating. Ah. Not having my father as a child. Now having your father does a lot. Massively. Massively. I, I would be get to the football ground an hour or two hours, sometimes probably two hours earlier, just sitting there imagining my dad turning up in case he gets there early, thinking the game's early. And I had no idea if he even knew about me playing football. But there's people in the village who knew my dad and uh, blah, 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 and I thought, you never know. So I have to get there in case he gets the wrong time. I'll get there early. And I realised now how that affected my life. Which is why I've always wanted to be a strong part of my children's life. Because I feel the pain of what I felt. Facts. Uh, Same. I can never be a deadbeat dad. Um, that's the biggest regret, biggest pain I ever or, have. Or, or not even a deadbeat, just not in my peep daughter life. I have had the similar sort of pains now where I don't get to see my youngest son. That's been stopped for five months ago because I get Osmond warnings. The mother used that to stop me. But I've been getting them. She knew I was getting them when not, she fell pregnant. Just, just an act of uh, nastiness. I feel that really bad in the moment because I feel the pain that my son's feeling. I know he's feeling that pain because when I was seeing him, he would squeeze me around the neck and wouldn't let go. He just kept squeezing me and squeezing me and squeezing me as hard as he could. Not just a quick squeeze, but just kept his head in there. And I thought, this boy's trying to tell me something. There's something, he's, he misses and loves his dad, but he's telling me something. I've just found out that his mother's been, having, uh, been seeing a fella for over a year, having family holidays with him. She's telling the court she's a struggling single parent. Far from that, I can assure you. The amount of Botox in her head. She ain't struggling. <laughs> and as well, um, Kev, if you had one wish, what would that be? I had one wish. For myself or for the world? For yourself. Overturn this conviction. Clearly. And I can, uh, if I overturn this conviction, well, if, but when I overturn this conviction, my life will change and many other people's lives will change. Sure. Massively. And before we finish as well, okay, is there anything that you'd love to say? Free the guys. How come I never got a slice of cake with my cup of tea? What's wrong with this dude? Do y'all know leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post. I'm gone, man.